Welcome to St. James's Online Worship for May 17th, the sixth Sunday of Easter. Wherever you are and however you are participating in this and whenever you are participating in this, I hope that this worship will give you a taste of God's unconditional love and valuing of you. Just want to remind folks a thing that I've been saying in our online worship moments that I hope you will find a way to participate in this worship. While you can watch this uh, video passively as a as a just a viewer, um, and that's fine. Um, you will sort of engage in it more deeply if you participate, whether that's singing or chatting if you're on the YouTube premiere or standing and sitting as the liturgy suggests you should. Now, the more you give yourself to the active participation in worship, the more it as an opportunity for Christ to enter into you and to give you the peace and joy that he wants you to have. But do participate in whatever way is most comfortable for you. 
Our worship bulletin can be found on the church's website if you don't already have it. That's www.stjamescambridge.org. Our service begins with us saying together the opening acclamation. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you've prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it he who was Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 66, verses 7 through 18. Bless our God, you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who holds our souls in life and will not allow our feet to slip. For you, O God, have proved us you have tried us just as silver is tried. You brought us into the snare. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let enemies ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out into a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and I will pay you my vows, which I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you sacrifices of fat beasts and the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats. Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he's done for me. I called out to him with my mouth and his praise was on my tongue. If I had found evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. 
Blessed be God who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld his love from me. The second reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 13 to 22. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that's in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Christ. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned, I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I am you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, church. At the beginning of our worship in these days of a global pandemic, the presider usually says something about how we are still one body, even though the wor we worship in various locations. Today's scriptures, all of them in some way affirm this very truth. So while we are yet a dislocated community, worshiping within our own various households. And while we may be feeling disconnected from each other, the good news of the gospel this morning is that we are all indeed part of God's household. Andre Rublev's 15th century icon of the Trinity depicts the essence of the Johannine vision of God. The Bible scholar Mary Colloe describes it this way. The Rublev icon of the Trinity draws the viewer into the scene to take her place at the table, to fill the empty space and complete the circle. The three figures are depicted in a moment of deep communion. The central figure, Jesus, holds his hand in blessing over the cup containing the head of the sacrificial lamb, calf. His eyes are turned to the father whose face bears infinite sadness as he returns the gaze of the son. The third figure robed in green is the vivifier. 
the eternally young spirit whose face always depicts a depth of sadness in contemplating the costliness of love. You, my friends, are invited to this table, entering into the Trinitarian relationship, not as deity, but as a creature relating to its creator. I was captured by Mary Colloy's work because she traces the symbol of household. And since most of us remain stuck at home, it seemed like a fitting image to consider. She traces the symbol of household in the book of John, along with its Hellenistic social context, its narrative context, and its theological context. So besides getting you stoked to read the next book on your lockdown um, pandemic reading list, I hope we might venture together to understand how, many, how, how it is that many households are invited and indeed joined with the household of God in this season. Now you'll recall that the Gospel of John, it's written well after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. John is written to an audience of God's people needing encouragement to remain faithful even without a temple or a central place of worship. Koloe goes even further to argue that the fourth gospel lacks explicit instruction on rituals for God's people. John is not so much interested in the practices surrounding Eucharist, liturgy, worship, sacrifice, hierarchy, and other typical ecclesial marks found in the synoptic gospels, for example. And I highlight this only because it's even more fitting during our own time of Eucharistic fasting and social distancing. The marks of the church are forced to look different in these days. John symbolically moves the presence of God from the temple to the world when he proclaims that God became human and dwelt among us. In John 1, Jesus is tabernacling among us, building his home among us. The movement of the narrative is leading us toward a mutual indwelling, an invitation that Jesus offers to his disciples. He explains there are many rooms in my father's house and that he is preparing a place for us in this household. And now by the time we get to chapters 14 and 15, he discloses that if we dwell in him, his return to the Father will draw us into his own indwelling reciprocal love. Abiding in Jesus, disciples of all times will be able to participate in the loving and dynamic life of the triune God. Which brings us back to the icon from the beginning of the sermon. Since so much of John's meaning emerges symbolically, I wondered about a thought experiment. What would John be writing to us if he were here now? In this time of shelter in place laws and social distancing? Well, perhaps John would encourage us by explaining that we know what it means to be socially distant from Christ. Because after all, he sits at the right hand of the Father, and we are here. But that doesn't mean Christ is spiritually distant. Or it doesn't mean that he has to be spiritually distant. And just because we don't touch and see the body and blood of Christ each Sunday, doesn't mean Christ is spiritually absent. Perhaps John would tell us of the many households that are invited into God's household. Instead of the father's house of many rooms, perhaps it's a city with many households. The final symbolic image of the household in the gospel for us today is that of an orphan. Jesus explains that we, his disciples, will not be left as orphans, those without a household. 
Now consider with me the first century household ideology. Friendship and household relationships overlap. An ancient household was thought to be economically self-sufficient, or at least the ones that were well run, by those um, who live in the household and through those who were friends with um, the household. Ultimately, this determines its social standing. It's a bit like the idea of maybe social capital. An orphan without a household, without friends or belonging, has nothing in the eyes of the world. But the gospel says we will not be left as orphans. The gospel says that even though we are distant, we are a community that participates in the communion, the deep, abiding communion with the triune God. I don't know about you, but John's gospel today leaves me feeling encouraged. Encouraged that even though the physical practices and ecclesial practices look different, they feel and are experienced very differently for us. We are still God's people, worshiping, gathered, communing. And if we want, and through our friendship with Christ, we are just as close to our creator, redeemer, and sustainer as ever. I will invite you to reflect on this final image um, of the Rublev icon. At this time, I would like to invite you to reflect and perhaps you will silently and internally reflect. Perhaps you wanna share your reflection among your own household or perhaps you wanna share your reflection in the chat box if you're able to do that. In any case, Take a moment to look and maybe appreciate the image. Where do you see yourself? How do you imagine you are approaching the table today? What kind of spiritual or emotional state are you in? I close with a short passage from Psalm 66 read earlier in our service. I will come into your house, O Lord, with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, those that my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. Through Christ our Lord, amen. I now invite you to stand as you are able and join me in proclaiming the faith of the church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
the prayers of the people. Let us pray to God, who alone makes us dwell in safety. For all who are affected by coronavirus, through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who are guiding our nation at this time in shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For doctors, nurses, and medical researchers, and all essential workers, that through this skill and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Risen One. Amen. He you to join me in the words of longing and expectation words that give voice to our desire to break bread again together in person together we say alleluia christ our passover is sacrificed for us therefore let us keep the feast alleluia when we share our bread with one another the lamb of god will make us one alleluia 
Alleluia. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Together we say, we go forth in the power of the risen Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. In the poppies of flower, in the seed and apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be. Unrevealed until it sees on something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From our past will come the future, what it holds a mystery. Unrevealed until it sees on something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our thought there is believing. In our life, eternity, in our death, our resurrection, at the last of victory, unrevealed until it sees on something God alone can see.